coming up. Good. Um, so yeah, Unix machine learning. And so uh, what, what's new since uh, Unix system five and the, the, the machine learning world? Basically since 1980 or so, there's two really big engineering things that have happened. Uh, the first is we have GPUs. And the second, which is uh, closer to like the last 10 to 20 years is that we have modern SAT and SMT solvers. Uh, GPUs allow us to do massively parallel uh, vector calculations, which makes things like training deep neural nets now feasible. And modern SAT SMT solvers allow us to officially compute solutions to uh, NP hard problems that uh, appear in the real world and are actually have a lot of symmetries that we can break or sparsity that actually allows us to um, efficiently solve them. And the third thing that I'd put in is that there's a mathematician out of Poland, uh, Jaroslaw Duda, Jarek, uh, and he has had some pretty interesting breakthroughs in the past decade in terms of both uh, in, uh, uh, data compression. Uh, uh, so uh, Facebook's so ZSTD, uh, the uh, uh, ZRAM on Linux, uh, all uses his uh, asymmetric numerical systems coding, and also, uh, he has a couple papers down here on putting autoencoders uh, using, uh, if you're doing a machine learning vision, uh, using uh, toruses and stuff to, uh, yeah, I won't pull up the paper, but basically he just projects the image to a torus to get rid of some of the orientation effects that you'd normally have. Um, so yeah, he's, he's worth a, a look. Anything by Yark Duda here. Um, Donald Knuth got really interested in SAT SMT solvers originally with a, a bunch of lectures he did on binary decision diagrams back around 2008. Uh, in about 2015, uh, he released uh, his latest fast seal that's all about SAT solving. And so if you're interested in how these modern SAT solvers work, that's probably the, the book to go to, the one that Donald Knuth just uh, published here in 2015. Um, and actually, this goes back before Unix system five. Uh, so Valiant uh, proved that a uh, Boolean matrix matrix multiply is equivalent to context-free grammar parsing. So if we want to, and, G and Google's actually uh, done like a proof of concept on this, we can parse on GPUs. The thing is that no one's actually taken uh, Lex and Yak or even like the, the GCC or LLVM front end and uh, targeted GPU. So if you want to make a lot of systems code a lot more efficient, uh, port your parser to a GPU. It, it, you can actually do it. Uh, so for those that are interested in learning more about uh, SAT and SMT solvers, which I'm not going to be covering today, which I am using more in practice, uh, Denis Yurichev, I believe he's Russian, uh, he has a really great uh, PDF that I linked. It's basically a full-on textbook that a lot of uh, the, the uh, university courses out there are using. It's called SAT SMT by example. And it it's mostly uses Python code um, and, and the Python libraries around Microsoft Z3 SMT solver, which is probably one of the best ones out there. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's just a really good resource. If you want to, if you have some NP hard problem and you want to be able to script a uh, solution to it, uh, this is a, a great resource to learn how to do that. Uh, and also Philip Zucker here, uh, he has a uh, Jupyter notebook uh, that uh, he posted for a, a, a workshop that I just did at, at the MIT Sloan, sorry, whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it's a really great uh, Python uh, Z3 tutorial for using their Python libraries for doing SMT solving. Uh, and so SMT solving is SAT uh, modulo theories, which just adds a bunch of stuff on top of the SAT solver to make it more amenable for doing software analysis, mostly. <coughs> so, as we're going about doing uh, machine learning projects, remember that we already have a lot of great techniques um, from the large software projects that we've worked on before we started doing machine learning type stuff. Uh, and GNU Make is still a very good tool for uh, setting up your, your data pipelines. And so I would highly recommend before you start getting out something like 
Apache Airtable or something fancy, just start with a make file and that will get you a long way. Um, another thing, uh, as you're writing these services at scale, uh, make sure that you paginate your APIs. So instead of returning all gigabyte of answers at once, try to make it sit, return like, you know, segments of like a hundred answers or something like that. And there's a lot of good resources out there. Uh, if, if you're backing these by a SQL database or something, how to uh, to get your select statements and stuff set up so they, they're able to, to query that in a paginated way without having to keep uh, uh, pointers in the database open all the time. And, and another big thing is just be clean about your data lineage. And so if you have software services that are serving up data, try to serve up metadata for where this data came from so that you can uh, get back to whatever the, the, the end source of truth, whether that be your megacorp, you know, big mainframe database or, or some flat file, whatever it is. Um, as you're building out these machine learning pipelines, always put in the data lineage where everything came from so you can reconstruct it if you have to. Uh, as far as IDEs that people use for machine learning, uh, this actually works on a cell phone. It's called a Google CoLab, if it loads here. And it's just a Google hosted Jupyter notebook. And all you have to do is have a, uh, um, you, just, you just need to use a, a Google login. And uh, here uh, I have a, a Phil Zucker's uh, um, Z3 tutorial loaded. And it's just a Python Jupyter notebook. And I'm not gonna run that right now though. Go back here. Uh, da, 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 da. Another one, uh, if you're in the machine learning space on an Amazon system, uh, they have uh, these SageMaker notebooks on uh, Amazon, which is basically their, their, their branded uh, Jupyter notebook that basically launches an EC2 instance that has a Jupyter notebook in it that you can connect to. Um, I, I, I personally don't use them that much. Um, there's a lot of tools now for uh, Visual Studio Code, which now runs the GitHub Code Spaces branded. Um, you can basically uh, do an IDE in your browser uh, and host it off of any Linux-based server. So I, I definitely check that out. It, it's, it's really great for having nice IDE with your you know, Linux server right? and I think just you know, talks over SSH or something. Um, but but that, that that's really nice because I can use my Mac laptop and connect to basically any Linux box in the cloud and have that nice uh, cloud Linux connection, uh, sorry, network connection that, that's way faster than my uh, the one in my apartment here. Um, and I might pull up this later because I'm actually on my M1, but Apple has a new uh, GUI product out here called Create, uh, which is a graphical tool for uh, creating a lot of these machine learning pipes on your, your latest Apple uh, device. Yeah. So if, if you want to spend $600 and get the, um, the new M1 uh, mini, that, that comes with it. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and, and, then there's the edit and there's the editor that I use on a regular basis, NeoVim. Uh, yeah, you just usually install that on your, your Linux system, yum apt, whatever. What is uh, Vim written in? Is like, is that just another C and C plus plus project? Because I've heard. I honestly bit. don't know. I would have to look at it. It, it. it has. I haven't played with it too much. I, I either hit Vim or Neo Vim, depending on what my my system has. It's just a. Uh, it's just Vim with a lot of nice things. At, I, I haven't got down to scripting it too much, honestly. So, um, and the TLDR that I've, I've seen from like the Vim conference is that. Uh, NeoVim is just kind of, it's still in its infancy. It's get, uh, gaining traction because um, regular Vim, if anyone don't, that doesn't know, is still written and managed by the same author and it's single threaded. So um, development's kind of slow and to embrace the community because uh, we're all afraid of the author um, passing away because he just said, well, then it's our problem. Um, NeoVim is a way of keeping a favorite text editor alive for the future. Um, so, sorry to interject. It looks like, uh, yeah. is this C or C++? C, C++. <laughs> I so, like yeah, it. it. It looks like it 
Yeah, it looks like C, C++ code. So yeah, mostly C. I'm not seeing too many C, C++ files. So yeah, it, it should run at, at machine speed for nice optimizations under the hood. Um, if, you're, if you're editing something on a large code base. Uh, Edward Komet, who's a, in the Haskell community, gave a shout out to the other, the other day and I, I've been using it. So before you dive into deep neural nets, uh, I would highly recommend you first try to check out the uh, Python scikit-learn library, which has a lot of uh, less complex traditional machine learning uh, algorithms in it uh, for doing image classification, uh, linear regression, whatnot, clustering, uh, dimensionality reduction if you're trying to get rid of extra variables. Uh, yeah, just a, and also a data pre-processing stuff to get rid of noise. Um, I, I would highly recommend that. And also check out uh, the Kegel uh, data competitions uh, for whatever area you're interested in. They usually have Python notebooks for, you know, this is how we did such. And a lot of these winners uh, of these data science uh, competitions uh, are, are using tools like uh, scikit-learn, um, not necessarily deep learning stuff. So don't always go for deep learning first. Try the easy stuff. Um, so what backs most of deep learning stuff? Uh, neural networks. So the idea is that you have some, can you guys see my mouse pointer? Yes. Okay. Um, so you have some output, uh, which is usually like, you know, yes or no, Boolean, whatever, um, and a bunch of inputs. And in between, you have a bunch of uh, neural network layers, uh, which go into transfer functions. Each of these have uh, weights in the middle. And so the idea of backpropagation is it uses the, the chain rule from calculus. And, it, and uh, you know, if this is a good or a bad input, I mean, wh whether this uh, activation function is, is correct or not, it tries to either promote or punish the different uh, weights that go into it, kind of using a, a gradient descent based search uh, to, uh, to kind of train this thing so that uh, it, it learns the function under test. Um, and there's actually, I should have linked to this earlier. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick Google here. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, th there's a really good, uh, I believe it's on the TensorFlow website where they have really small neural nets uh, with just a couple neurons and you can just uh, play by adding and subtracting neurons or adding and subtracting layers or changing what these transfer functions are and just get a, a kind of a feel for the power of, you know, what, what it looks like for very small data. Um, which is very good to visualize. Um, what one tip that I like to give anybody is that a, a lot of my intuition from this is actually from doing computer graphics work uh, in OpenGL, uh, where you actually have to do uh, vector, you know, dot products and whatnot. Uh, so I would highly recommend if you if you haven't done any graphics programming, uh, take whatever graphics package you like, you know, be that OpenGL, WebGL, what and just uh, learn how to do image, image rotations, uh, you know, dot products and whatnot. And that will uh, give you a, a lot better visualization in your head when you see these huge mathematical formulas of these complex nets that you, you can at least in, in two and three dimensions kind of visualize what, what's going on. Um, so the most common uh, neural network that we see a lot, especially in like, like the, uh, the image processing space is a convolutional neural net. And this is just a link to the Wikimedia article where you have uh, essentially these big uh, feature maps kind of, and then they just have smaller and smaller and smaller layers. And then at the end, they just kind of out, you know, is this a hot dog or not? And actually if you Google for the hot dog or not uh, application, um, that's actually, from a software engineering perspective, very interesting that they, they, they did for the HBO episode. That's actually a real uh, application, especially in terms of uh, how they shrink it uh, at the end, which I, I've never actually deployed one of these in real life. Um, so that's kind of at a high level what these, uh, have a, yeah. Was there a question or comment? I think someone accidentally bumped the mute button. Okay, 
that's fine. <laughs> Um, so, so, so that, that's what most, uh, I mean, the, the general shape you'll see, and, and, and I'll go later, there's a bunch of, of specialized ones that they've came up with. And the other type of neural net that you'll see most often is called a long short-term memory neural net. And these are used uh, in, in, in the area of time series uh, and also uh, doing analysis on text streams. So if you wanted to build like a, a linter for some tool, uh, you could essentially put in uh, good and bad examples and feed it through this thing and it would uh, hopefully come up with a, a neural network trained linter for your whatever software tool you're using. I, I've seen a, a couple of recent papers on that. Um, so so for, for the software space, this type of neural net seems to be a lot more useful than the ones that they're using for, uh, for image search. Um, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that later. Um, so, you know, none, none of us really have, well, some of us might, that are students, uh, have time to come up with a lot of these models on our own. And so there's this website called TensorFlow Hub, and it has all kinds of pre-made uh, neural network, uh, deep learning uh, net networks that are already created for you that you can just use out of the box with your own data. Um, so, so TensorFlow Hub is a good one, and also Brad Dwyer here locally who has RoboFlow, he also has a lot of uh, very nice ones in the uh, image domain, and one of the nice things I like about the way that Brad has this set up is they almost all have uh, Google Colab notebooks uh, linked to them, to where you can play with them right there uh, on your cell phone or whatever you have that, you know, logs into Google Colab. So that, that's a very nice resource of, of just being able to play with the different uh, uh, image detection networks as, as they come out. Um, and also, uh, where do you get the data for these? Because not everybody has uh, time to, to come up with their own data. Uh, so the AWS Open Data is actually a really good resource if you want to do things that are like global scale in terms of doing uh, like, like weather, uh, geo mapping stuff, uh, like that kind of research, uh, whole genome analysis. Uh, there's just a lot of really great data sets on here. Um, there was even one that had like IRS 990 forms if you want to do data mining on all of the IRS filings by nonprofits in the US. So there's just, just a, a wide range of interesting data sets on here. Um, and then uh, Brad has on, on his, his RoboFlow a uh, Wait, did I link the wrong one? Image data sets. Sorry, uh, he has a bunch of uh, pre-trained uh, image data sets uh, that various users have uploaded and pre-tagged. Um, and there's like a whole uh, there's like a whole area of research into how to um, <clears throat> try to get automated tagging out of these, so you don't have to get a human in the loop. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if, if you've ever seen Brad's product. So what it does is it basically takes a lot of a lot of the command line tools that you'd normally use and it puts it in a little web GUI. Uh, and and he, he, he published this before Apple's core ML came out. And a lot of, a lot of this you can now do in their, their GUI tool. Um, and I think he hosts most of his stuff here on uh, Google Compute. It, it's not on AWS, but you can get a free account. You don't have to pay for it. Um, but he does a lot of uh, not only just annotating, um, but he also has a lot of uh, things on here that will automatically like rotate your images and stuff. Um, things that I normally wouldn't pay someone to do, but some companies like his, his data flow. Uh, so yeah, uh, a really interesting development uh, in the past couple of years um, in the area of what's called automatic differentiation uh, is this tool called Enzyme out of MIT. And what it does is it allows us to get derivatives uh, on LLVM targeted code. So C, C++, Rust, Swift, Go. Um, and, and what it does is it, it takes you know, your functions and for every time you do an assignment, it essentially does a parallel uh, uh, assignment of what the derivative would be for that, that assignment. 
except it does it down at the LLVM inter intermediate, the LLVM compiler intermediate representation layer. And it does this after you've already applied all your optimizations. And so you can very easily in an automated fashion get derivatives for functions for free without having to code them by hand at scale, which is amazing. In, in the past, before this, you had to hand code all of these derivatives, I, I, which I would not want to do by hand. Um, yeah, I, I can't underscore how amazing this, this enzyme tool is uh, for being able to get, uh, you know, whatever function you have that, and being able to differentiate it so you can do some of these gradient descent machine learning type algorithms on it. Because because most of them have some sort of, uh, you have to you know take a derivative under the hood for them to search. Uh, in terms of popular deep learning frameworks, uh, the two most popular are uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch is very much flavored af after the Python uh, NumPy library. Uh, and so the syntax of it uh, looks very similar um, to Python uh, ND arrays, if you've ever seen that. And there's a bunch of good tutorials about um, you know, concatenating these tensors, which are, are basically like a, a vector type data structure that has a lot more operations than just the, the normal ND arrays. Um, and then Google also came out with a Keras uh, Python binding to its uh, TensorFlow package uh, that, that's also popular. Uh, and here's a, if you don't want to code at all, uh, I don't want to play this video, but um, Brad went to the Omaha Zoo back around Thanksgiving. And uh, is that not playing? anyway, he went to the Omaha Zoo around Thanksgiving and he uh, went to the shark aquarium and he tagged a bunch of sharks just using his phone. And he just goes through step by step of how to, um, how to tag the images and, uh, up, and uh, yeah, just basically build a shark detector without actually having to write any. Uh, any PyTorch or, um, uh, or TensorFlow code because Apple's uh, uh, Create ML uh, just basically does it all for you in the GUI. Um, in terms of structured data formats, I these are probably the most popular that, that I've seen a lot of people using. Uh, SQLite three is an embedded database, and it's and it's. Uh, the embedded database that's already on your iPhone or Android phone that the system stores almost all of its data in. I would highly recommend using SQLite before going to something else, um, just because it's super portable and super performant. Um, there's Apache Parquet, which is a, a column-based format. Uh, Apache Arrow, which is very close to the old uh, MPI drive data types. Uh, that uh, has like fixed length vectors, which allows you to do GPU processing super easy. Um, there's Apache Avro, which I believe is more of a row oriented format. And so it's, it's not gonna compress as well. And also Apache Orc is another uh, column uh, oriented format. And, and why column oriented makes a lot of difference is because as I mentioned, uh, Yarek Duda up top uh, came up with that, uh, the compression scheme and you can do something called dictionary compression where uh, if, you, if you download the, the ZSTD tool and you can train it on a path of uh, data files and it will create for you a dictionary. And then every time you compile, or sorry, every time you do a compression, you can pass in this dictionary file. And so the dictionary file kind of acts as like a, I don't know, a secret handshake or like inside knowledge for back of a better term. And so if you have a, a heterogeneous, sorry, a homogeneous data set like a log file um, that's very repetitive. It, it, it uh, takes some of the, the compression uh, from this dictionary file and, and uses those symmetries on all your other files. And you can get some, some really huge uh, savings. Like here's a, like a, like Facebook and in, in what they were using for a lot of their, uh, stuff in their data center, they're just getting massive compression on, on these small files, like, like JSON files or whatnot, uh, by using this dictionary compression on them. So definitely check out uh, dictionary compression of your files because you can get a lot better, you know, 
bandwidth over the network and also cost savings in terms of storage. Uh, and also if you are on AWS, they have a, an instance you can uh, run called the spot instance, which is basically the market price. And uh, these, uh, sorry, let's see if I can shrink this. That didn't work. Sorry, what did I just do? Ah. I may be able to show people the cheapest you can get a spot instance in, out of all of AWS. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert on this, but I I I, I looked here into a little and the only reason why is because I had so you know how lift and shift to the cloud is considered to be an anti-pattern. Yeah. We're a, a former Fortune five company that is doing lift and shift to the cloud. We are the largest um, private cloud instance in all of AWS across the world, meaning we're doing it wrong gloriously. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I got to pull up the numbers for the spot instances, but it's a, it's still ridiculously cheap. Oh, yeah, yeah. And also the market isn't efficient either. Um, the ARM instances are a lot cheaper in some spots. And here, just just because people, because of their network security, they pin it to certain availability zones. Here, I mean, look at the price graph on US East 1A versus everybody else. I mean, all of a sudden, one's Fortune 500 clients like, oh, crap. Maybe we should use other AZs for our spot instances, and the price went bam. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, ch check out spot instances. Uh, you can save a lot of, and and Duckbell Group, which we mentioned earlier, um, their their sweet spot for for their clients tends to be uh, batch runs of about an hour to four hours on AWS Spot, um, and, and trying to chunk their data sets into at least hundred megabyte chunks. Uh, because on, on services like S3, you pay per request, and that can really add up on, on small files. Um, but anyway. Uh, and also, as, as you're doing these data science uh, workflows, try to keep in mind your, your data locality, because you want to try to keep things as close to the CPU as possible. Um, and so probably the most uh, widely used example is uh, array of structures versus a structure of array. So if I have a, a struct uh, called pointless 3D, this is this like in some 3D graphics application, and I'm storing three different arrays uh, for the X, Y, and Z coordinates uh, versus I have a struct that has uh, X, Y, and Z all in one, one struct. Usually this top pattern is a lot more efficient because I can uh, take whole dimensions as, as vectors and do a lot more vector processing on them where uh, here I'm usually wasting uh, a lot of my data load because I'm, all, I'm also loading this Y and Z at the same time when I really only want to be computing on this X dimension. And so just, just be mindful of how you organize your data so that it's, it's a cache-friendly uh, data. And there's a, there's a really good book here called uh, Data-Oriented Design, which goes through a lot of these uh, just tricks that you'll use as, as you're coming up with your, you know, do I, do I store this in column format or row format? Uh, just, just a lot of things you want to think about there. And uh, another good book is uh, Designing Data Intensive Applications. Uh, I've got to load. And that talks a lot more at the, uh, like the whole database level in terms of using hashing and uh, just network transfer stuff. Uh, and also, as you're profiling this, uh, user bin time, not to be confused with the uh, built-in time function that might be in your shell, uh, is a very amazing uh, quick way of profiling your code to see how fast it's running. Uh, I, I, I was profiling a, a, just a quick Scala command line application like a day or two ago. And by default, it was using like 80 megabytes to process like a 20K file, which is insane. So yeah, user bin time. And if you add a, a dash V, or if you're on Apple BSD at a dash L, that won't just give you the runtime. It'll also dump out a bunch of uh, OS counters. And so how many uh, times it paged the OS, how many times the OS had to pause it, um, the maximum memory used by that process. Um, yeah, I, I would highly recommend using this before going to some more fancy profiling tool just to get a quick and dirty, you know, this is kind of what resources this, this, this process is consuming. Uh, another tool that I love uh, in terms of, of data modeling 
it's it's called a guesstimate, and it's actually a, a JavaScript based uh, tool uh, that allows you to make uh, these. Uh, let me just scroll down here. It essentially does Monte Carlo simulations uh, on on data that you already have. And so you can get these bell curve uh, probability, distrib probability distribution functions that you're computing on instead of like a single point. Uh, and, and at the end, you get a probability distribution function other, uh, instead of saying, you know, with 50% with probability, such and such will happen, you'll, you'll see the whole bell curve or, or whatever your distribution is. Um, and that is a, a really interesting tool for doing uh, simulations with data that you already have in hand. So if you're doing like a farm economics uh, data simulation, you can put in the historic prices of like fuel or like, or like the historic weather patterns and have them input as, as bell curves in terms of like your, your pricing calculations, which is really nice. Um, uh, another thing that uh, you should also look into, uh, well, first of all, if you have like rust or something, uh, bee trees are, are built in. Um, so, so first of all, use bee trees everywhere because they're very cash friendly. And uh, if, you've already, if you're already using bee trees, uh, you can also do something called learned index data structures, also cool. <laughs> which, which tunes the hashing algorithm to your data set. Um, Google, uh, so uh, Jeff Dean, you know, top software engineer at Google, uh, he came out with this in probably like 2018. And then there's a new GitHub project uh, by some Italian guys uh, that actually implements this as a library that you can use. And you just get insane speed ups by tuning the hash rate algorithms uh, to your specific data set instead of just pretending it's random data because it's usually not random data. And so you can get like, you know, 80% faster lookups on, on your, your, your hashing by, by using learned indexes. Um, another thing you can do to try to cut down your memory usage is uh, use succinct data structures. Uh, so the, the Google ZSDD library uses this heavily. And so there's a lot of data structures. I'm trying to see if they have a list of them here. And, oh, here we go. Um, so if, if you're using uh, bit vectors, uh, suffix arrays, uh, yeah, range minimum queries, um, you can, you can uh, really cut down the amount of memory you use that you use uh, in doing computations on these type of things. Uh, and that can really speed you up because you're not going to be chucking stuff from RAM into cache as often. Um, and also, uh, there is the SIMD JSON project. Uh, so you, I, I would recommend against using JSON uh, as a file format because it's very inefficient. Um, but uh, uh, Lemire, who's Canadian, uh, he's came up with a very good... Uh, the you're, JSON. You're roboting a little bit, so give the secondary connection to sync up. Is that better? Much. Thank. You. There we go. Yeah. So, so SIMD JSON is is a really good project to look at. Um, so he's taken a JSON parser, and he's ported it uh, to the AVX five five twelve uh, SSC. If you're on Intel architectures, or Neon if you're on ARM. Uh, for, which is a si single instruction, multiple data. So doing uh, processing like four or eight registers at once. Um, and so if you're doing anything with a UTF-8 a Unicode text streams, definitely look at this code and you can probably speed up a lot of your uh, Intel code uh, and also probably a lot of your ARM code, unless you're on the Apple M1. And actually the M1 is actually fast enough now in terms of uh, how fast it can pull from memory that some of this stuff isn't even worth doing because it, it's pulling from memory fast enough the way that they've set the memory architecture up that uh, the, the SIMD doesn't help any, but that's, that's, that's for another talk. Um, another, another tangent is, uh, I was gonna ask, have you uh, attempted anything with Graviton instances that are trying to call up Neon? And if there's the same type of Memory I have not, there. but 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 okay. if I was going to benchmark with it, I would use the SIMD JSON project. I, I I know that Neon instances are turning out to be a lot cheaper for a lot of image processing workflows that aren't GPU; they're CPU bound. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, definitely look into Graviton uh, batch spot workers to see if you can save some money there. 
I have a question for you at the end, then, because I have an ARM Kubernetes cluster then that I would pick your brain on. Yeah. Um, and another technique that, that a lot of, uh, especially this is useful in the, the genome big data processing space, or something called bloom filters. Uh, bloom filters are a probabilistic uh, data structure uh, that is, that's compressed. And it will tell you if something's not in the set. So it'll, it'll tell you if, if your, your network call to look up the thing in the set isn't going to work, like, like the thing doesn't exist in, in your S3 bucket. And it will probabilistically tell you with high probability whether the thing, uh, it thinks it exists or, or not. So this is a, a very, I mean, it, it can give you false positives, in other words. Um, so this is a very good uh, way if you have like just a, a gigabyte of uh, data out in S3, you can create a bloom filter on it and store it locally and try to query this thing before you actually hit the network and pull from the drive. It, because the, if the data doesn't exist, there's no reason to do the network call. Um, so that can save you a lot of uh, network bandwidth. Uh, and then also uh, just to save RAM, uh, there's a lot of uh, techniques that you can do to uh, process large data files <coughs> in, in, in constant or logarithmic memory. And these are called the uh, uh, streaming algorithms. Uh, I, I believe this count and sketch uses the same algorithm actually as, as the bloom filter. Um, there's top K if I want to know like the, the top five, you know, things that come along in my screen, uh, hyper log log, uh, yeah, th these are all good things to check out uh, so that you can scale uh, large data sets to small amounts of RAM. And uh, this book I just found the other day, actually it's not a book, it's, it's, a, um, it's an archive, uh, which is a really good overview of all the latest uh, deep neural network applications, which is much more intelligent than I am on everything. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a really good resource. And also, let's see, where did I have that? Um, yeah, the guys at RoboFlow have a lot of uh, good videos on their YouTube channel, um, and they usually post a lot of good stuff. So yeah, questions, comments, anything? I have a question, but it'll be Kubernetes related. So if anyone else wants to go first. Just wanted to key in and say uh, thanks for presenting. Uh, sorry, I only grabbed the uh, tail end of it here. Uh, things went longer than what I expected. Andrew, I have to say this, the, the definitely just bookmark the GitHub page because that markdown is something that's gonna cost me at least like a week of study. This is so cool. First of all, awesome presentation, Chad. <laughs> Um, but uh, my big question is, um, so with using like neon instruction sets, I was kind of curious, is there a way that you've worked with already for like a batch workflow in Kubernetes for doing some type of like um, AI uh, image processing at all? Like, is there anything like, uh, like where you can say, here's a cluster, here's a data set, go. It, it depends on what you're, I mean, there's nothing magical about ARM versus, I mean, you just have to recompile. I, I, I do know that there are, is a Rust library out there that is a lot faster than uh, image magic for a lot of image processing algorithms. Um, I, I wish I could link it off the top head. But, but yeah, d definitely look around at, for the different parsers for image formats to make sure you're using the one that's most performant. And also downsample it to, to what's the most sane. But, uh, but, but the, the nice thing about the ARM instances is, is they have the same network as the X6 instances, um, but they're cheaper. And a lot of your AWS uh, data crunching is uh, network bound. So you, you get the same bandwidth of network for cheap. Uh, the only reason why I'm asking because I actually have a Kubernetes cluster sitting underneath my TV that is ARM based like hardware here. So. And I was looking for more projects to be like, cool things you can do with your cluster for future talks. Um, so thank you. And the easy answer is to profile and uh, test stuff just because one thing is the canonical, oh, this is the best thing out there. Uh, 
it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best for your use case. Well, right. I'm just trying to show, hey, look what you can do. And most of the time, people will get my cluster when I go do talks. It's kind of like an intro thing. Uh, but the Rust library, I will definitely be looking that up because I was probably going to just play with image magic and cry at the performance. Image magic yeah, is image one of those things where it's you get what you pay for and more, but it also isn't the most performant. Yeah, I was just looking for simple. Thank you. Or efficient, basic. Yeah. I think it's this great. I, I haven't benchmarked it too much, but, but if I did a lot of image processing at scale, I would definitely shop around for the different uh, um, codes out there. I definitely will be doing that. Thank you. Um, and, and, and also uh, look in the Google Chrome code base. They have a lot of high performance parsers in there. So general question, kind of like above all of this, um, how did you start getting into in, or like AI and in general? Because you definitely, this is written up and seems more like a uh, developer background who kind of learned it on the fly very well. And not like, let's say someone who went to school and got like a master's in, in uh, uh, or, or AI. Well, I mean, my, my background is, uh, well, I, I was trained doing bioinformatics. And so a lot of this is just uh, not much different than that, other than GPUs now are a lot more uh, prevalent and the deep neural network stuff is out there. But in terms of like software design, not much has changed. <laughs> I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nice stuff out there like Rust now that gives you a lot of memory safety, but... And, and also bee trees are a lot more prevalent than they used to be. But, but yeah, and, and also your question, um, there's a project called uh, Super, uh, which is a super optimizer for LLVM. Uh, and so I actually, actually I, I got into SAT SMT solvers um, trying to do a, a protein folding optimization problem way back in the day. Um, long story. I, I hand coded something, and then years later, I, I, I just wrote a quick Python script for Microsoft C3, and it, it beat. Sorry, Dan has a question. Witness make files, those have been around. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and there's also an, a Live 2 project that John Raker has. Um, and that's for uh, proving compiler transforms correct. And if anybody's interested, uh, that those enzyme, that enzyme library, no one has actually taken a lot of the transforms that, for the automatic differentiation that it has in there and uh, came up with uh, SAT SMT proofs of them. So if anybody wants to contribute to the Alive project, uh, just basically copy and paste the LLVM IR transforms from enzyme and put them into Alive. And that, that would be a paper. Uh, when you say alive, is that called the alive toolkit? I'm posting the link right now. It looks like. Yeah, it's it's alive too. It's a it's a SAT SMT based. Uh, basically, give it two pieces of LLVM, IR, and it tries to prove the functions equivalent. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. So I guess the next question is, if someone was like, I'm. I'm getting just some of the basics done and I'll be touching on um, using Golang for doing some early uh, AI stuff. Um, my question is, is the Google Colab the way to start for trying to get some data sets and trying to apply some, um, you know, just kind of get, getting hands dirty with it? Or is it better to start someplace else? Because I can tell you right now, I have enough experience with GNU Make <laughs> So what would be the next uh, step that would be good towards like, you know, getting my hands dirty with uh, some, uh, some learning projects? Uh, Google Colab's nice uh, because it, it works on your cell phone. And also they have GPU instances. And I think if you pay like 10 bucks a month, they like actually give you some kind of beefy GPUs. Um, so just for the GPU interoperability, I, I like Google Colab over like using AWS Cloud Shell or something. 
But even their free contribution is pretty generous, really. I, I was more interested in using my local hardware just because, um, well, I overspent. <laughs> I want to use it properly. Jupyter Notebook is great. No, it's not. <laughs>